All right, hello, good morning. So today we're gonna to be looking at finding extrema using derivatives. Um, what extrema really means is just extreme values. Um, or we also call them maxima and minima. It's just the plural way to say these words, maximum and maximums and minimums. Um, and so, you know, this is gonna be a key skill when it comes to optimization, which is one of the bigger and more challenging topics of this course. So we're gonna kind of pre-process that and um, and be able to find max and min values in a bit of more automatic fashion. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> a quick framing and review. Um, again, what does derivatives, uh, what do derivatives have to do with extreme values and with uh, functions in general? Well, we know that for a function f, that f prime of x being positive implies that the function's increasing. We also know that if f prime is negative, it means the slope of the tangent line is negative, which means that f of x is decreasing. And we know that if f prime equals zero, this means that f is flat or has no change. And this will become relevant uh, a little bit later. And again, you've seen a lot of these ideas already, um, but we're just gonna kinda collect them in a more organized way here. Um, why do we care about extrema in general? You know, we care about extrema because we care about max and min values. We care about, um, you know, optimi optimizing a process. And this can be in the world of business. This can be in the world of engineering in particular. Um, physics, chemistry. What does optimizing mean? It means maximizing the output of something and minimizing the cost or inputs to something. Okay, so finding these maximum and minimum values is going to be important. Usually these are going to be done by a computer, but we need to be able to interpret the output. How does it come up with these answers so that we're able to have deep insight into problems? And so, you know, what is the, what is an extrema really in general? Um, it just means that it is higher or lower, higher or lower than nearby values values okay so at a certain point on the interval you can show that you know you've got some y value that's higher than the others or some y value that's lower than the others the others meaning here along the curve you can show that a function has taken on a value that is you know um, substantially higher or lower than uh, the function's values nearby. So just to be, you know, kind of totally clear on what these mean. So this is really what we mean when we say uh, a local maximum and minimum is this idea that, you know, we say that, you know, f of a is a local maximum if for nearby x values close to x equals a, we'd say that f of a is greater than all these f of x values. And just likewise for um, local minimums, we'll say similar for local min. You can show that f of a is lower than all the values nearby. And then you're like, well, what do we mean by nearby if we're being precise? Nearby really just means in a, in a small interval around it. And that's where we differentiate between uh, local and global maximum minimum. This means that we can show that f of a is a global maximum on the interval 
um, let's call it you know, x1 to x2 if for all x values in x1 to x2 f of a is greater than or equal to um, f of x. Okay, and likewise for minimums as well. Similar for min. So here, you know, it's it's maybe subtle the difference at first glance. This is really talking in a uh, neighborhood around a certain point. So like, you know, this would be a local max. This might be a local min, but the function might continue to do other things, turn around and, and do its own thing. Um, this is only a maximum here. If this function, um, you know, continued, let's say this is a local max, but this function might do something like this where it takes on a higher value. Okay, so it wouldn't be the global max. Whereas here, a uh, global max on an interval, we'd say, well, here's x1, my start point, here's my x2. And the function does something like this. Well, we can show that for all these other y values, this one's the highest, right? And so we'd call this the global max. All right. And here, this is a local max. And again, same idea for uh, minimums. Now you might be asking yourself, self, where does calculus come in here? Because I could just throw these into a graphing calculator. And that's true, um, but that wouldn't give us what we call an exhaustive list where we see all the possible maxes and mins. Really through calculus is where this power lies. And so what we need in order to do that are what we call critical points, okay? Um, so we need to differentiate between critical points and local maxes and mins, and we'll, we'll see why hopefully. Um, so what we define a critical point to be is a point where the derivative is zero or undefined. And you might be curious as to why would we care about that? Well, what we said over here is that we know that when, oops, we know that when f prime is zero, f of x is flat with no change. All right. And so that is the idea that we will be able to see these places of where the function turns around, so to speak because it will go from increasing to decreasing and have this flat spot, right? This moment where it has no change. And so we're looking for these critical points, a point where the derivative is zero or undefined, so then we can go investigate to see, is that a max or a min, in fact, okay? So we say P, you know, in an interval, X1 to X2 is a critical point if f prime of p equals zero or is undefined. And to have an undefined derivative means really you've, you've most likely gone vertical, right? Um, so it's either flat or it's shot vertical. This is what we call a critical point. All right, so we will uh, unpack that uh, by way of example in a minute. And actually, one more comment here, which is that I want you to think of these when we say we're looking for critical points, is to also call them like candidate points. Because it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a max or a min. For example, you could have some place where a function does something like this. We call like a plateau, where it is a slope of zero, but it's not a max or a min. It's kind of in the middle of this period of increase. Okay. So we call them candidate points because, I mean, I mean, no one calls them that except for me. I call them this to help highlight for students that these are really just test points and we do need to go and test them after we find them. Okay, So these can be involved problems um, and our, our brain typically wants to check out a little early. These you will not be quizzed on in, in any way. This is really for the math nerds out there to know that you're on solid footing. And uh, so the two theorems that we're kind of leaning on here is that uh, it's the first Fermat's theorem that 
if f has a local maximum or minimum at a point c and the derivative exists then the derivative must be zero okay so this is kind of how we know um, that assumption that we made before this is footed in proof that it says it's footing in proof and the second part is the extreme value theorem which really is one of the the secret weapons that powers a lot of mathematics and um, it says that if f is continuous on a closed interval then it attains an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum on the interval so the idea here for the extreme value theorem it should be pretty intuitive which is you've got a function on a interval from a to b if it's continuous that means you can't pick up your pencil right so I start some random point I do something here I can't pick up my pencil, I just want to go from A to B in some random level. What it's saying is that if you did that, you have to have a highest point. So maybe that's here, and you have to have a lowest point. It's not the end point here, but it is, you know, this dip that happened. And any way that you do that, it, there has to be a highest and a lowest value. Okay, so that's why it's called the extreme value theorem. It tells us that that has to be the case if F is continuous. If it's not, then all bets are off. So those are the theorems that we kind of are, are inherently working on. You do not need to be able to quote those in any way. So here's how we find extrema. All right. The first thing you're going to need to do is to find the derivative. Because if we're talking about where does a function take on a zero derivative, we need that derivative. So, you know, for some y equals f of x, we're going to find the, the derivative. Find um, f prime. Set the derivative equal to zero and solve for x. Solve for the points where that happens. These are, these x values are critical points. And then we'll classify each critical point as a local max, a local minimum, or neither. Like I said, it could be a plateau by using the first derivative test or the second derivative test. And I'll show you what those are, okay? So first we find the derivative, then we find critical points, then we test them, okay? That's the whole process. And this is for, again, local extrema. There's an added piece we gotta do when it comes to um, global extrema. All right, so let's just use a, a quick example here before we go on to global extrema. And we'll find any local extrema for the function y equals negative 3x squared plus 6x minus 2. So in general, right, what we're doing is we're looking for the places where this function turns around, if any. So we want to find the derivative of this function first. The derivative of this function, y prime, is negative 6x plus 6, right? This describes the rate of change. That will help us find where this function has a zero change because that's what we do in step two. We set the derivative equal to zero. So zero equals negative six x plus six and solve for x. Now, this is a simple equation. It's not always this simple because there might be more than just one point, but um, this is the process. So here we solve for x, all right, minus 6 equals minus 6x, so x must equal 1. So what is this? This is our critical point. We only have 1. There can be more, depending on the function. There's often more, but here we just have one critical point. But we don't know if this is a max or a min. Okay, we just know that this is where y prime equals zero, so likely a place the function turns around. But we don't know this. You know, I mean, you might know in the back of your head, okay, this is a parabola. There's only one place where it turns around, but we're suspending disbelief for a moment, okay? The third step is to use the first derivative test or second derivative test to um, classify this point. So here's where we need what these, what these uh, derivative tests are. 
All right, so in the interest of time, just kind of punch this up quickly for you. The first derivative test says that if x equals p is a critical point, and this really is just a summary of what we've talked about so far, it says that if f prime is less than zero leading up to x equals p, and if it is, um, and if it is greater than zero for x greater than p, then x equals p is a local minimum. And it helps to just kind of draw this out. What does it mean to be, you know, well, first of all, here's my x equals p point in space. You know, here's my f of p up in space. And f prime being negative for less than, it means that it's decreasing up to this point. f prime being greater than zero means that it's increasing after this point. And so it's clear that this is this must be a minimum in the points nearby. Okay, So that's what we mean when we say it's a local minimum. And that's the re result of this first derivative test. And just the opposite is the case for the other clause here, which is that if it's increasing towards this point and then decreasing away, then it must be a local max. Okay, so really it's just, does it change sign near this point? And so the way that we usually carry this out is by, you know, in, in practice is just test two easy values near and around meaning on both sides of x equals p. All right, so here for us, what we'll do in our problem, and get some good space over here, to apply the first derivative test, our critical point is x equals one, is our critical point. So then what are some easy values nearby x equals one? Well, x equals zero is pretty nice. X equals two is pretty nice. You'll often see people draw a number line for this and see, okay, here's, you know, x equals one is my critical point. I know that's important. So what's a nearby number that's easy? Zero and two. You could choose zero and 10 because you don't have any other critical points nearby, but you want it to be pretty close to it so that uh, you can tell what's going on. So then really what you're gonna do then is test f prime of zero and f prime of two and see what those values are or at least what their sign is. It doesn't quite matter what the value specifically is. But we know that f prime of zero would be negative six times zero plus six which is positive six. And we know f prime of two is negative six times two plus six which is negative six which is less than zero. And so we see in fact that this function is increasing to some point here and then decreasing away. And so we can conclude, since f prime did change signs, that x equals one is a local uh, maximum. And really what we'd say is that, you know, f of one is a local maximum, which is negative three times one squared plus six times one minus two. Often a, a point of confusion is to keep using y prime instead of the original f function. So what is this height? Negative three times one plus six is three minus two is one, okay? So we can say one comma one is really local maximum. Okay, that would be the more a uh, complete way to say this. Now we said before the first derivative test or the second derivative test would help us. I'm going to wait and show you the second derivative test in the next uh, example. Okay, so that was for finding local extrema, meaning just kind of in its own, they're in their own neighborhoods, but to find a global extrema means you're looking at a whole interval. Whole interval or domain. It might depend on the context or it might be in general across the whole real line for this function. So the process is actually very similar. Find the critical points, find those candidate points, evaluate the function at the critical points. 
So find those heights, those maxes and mins, and at the end points of the interval. This is something that students often forget because, again, these are more involved problems. So the more things there are, the more likely we are to forget things. And then we just compare them and say, well, the largest and smallest values are going to be the global maxes and mins. So as a sketch, you know, what I can show you, this is kind of how I picture this. So we've got this function that does something like this. All right. Find the critical points of the function. So we do this, you know, using calculus and we find, okay, I've got a critical point here, critical point here, critical point here, because why? These are relative maxes and mins or local maxes and mins and this will have its own height and this will have its own height and this sorry this will have its own height so we grab these values so we'll call this you know f of this is f of c2 here's f of c1 f of c3 but we also have to consider that we have a start and end point to this function a and b we're on this interval from a to b and so there are points here and here and these could very well be extreme values and indeed in this case we see that one of them is right the point b down here is sitting kind of in the middle of this range of critical points these local maxes and mins but over here at x equals a we see that this is actually the lowest um, this is the lowest value on the whole interval okay whereas you know f of b is like sitting right here so what we do at the end is just kind of rank these compare them and see all right what's the highest and lowest well this seems to be the lowest and this seems to be the highest but we do this typically numerically okay and that's the that's really the whole process all right so it really is finding the extreme, the, finding the extrema within the interval, testing the endpoints, and then comparing those y values to say definitively, this is the biggest, this is the smallest. Again, applications here, we're interested in optimizing. So finding those most, uh, most peak and most valley uh, values. So let's look at an example here. All right, so we want to find the local and global extrema of this cubic function. Cubic functions are pretty common, especially in business, uh, honestly, and uh, there's a lot of models that can be used. So we're going to do this with a relatively simple to follow function. Um, so we want to find local and global extrema. So I'm going to kind of go through the steps that we've done before a little bit quicker here, because I think this video is getting a little long. Um, so what do we do first? We want to find f prime derivatives not too bad here and the second step is to find critical points which means set f prime equal to zero and solve for the x values that make it true so only here can we then maybe factor out three on the left or right, divide both sides by three or multiply both sides by a third let's say we'll get zero equals x squared minus four x plus Three. This just makes this easier to solve by hand. Use the zero product principle here, x minus 3 and x minus 1. So then we get that x equals 1 or x equals 3 are critical points. And you might see it also written like this, like as a set, 1 are critical points or our candidate points we're going to use these in our derivative test so find the local and global extrema so for this um, I'm going to use the second derivative test and I'll write out what that means for you right now and the second derivative test states a similar thing to the first except it's a little bit um, maybe simpler as long as you understand the second derivative describes the concavity of a function, right? So if the if x equals p is a critical point, which we just found, then if the second derivative is positive there, that means that this is a local minimum. Again, the reasoning behind this is that if you have a uh, function, 
where you found it's a critical point, f, uh, f double prime being positive means that it's concave up. What would a function that's concave up look like at this point? Like that. It would mean that it's decreasing towards it and increasing away, so that would in fact show us that we have a local minimum. Whereas just the opposite is true if the concavity is negative. It means it's concave down, or what we call, um, this is really just what we call concave, and this the upper one would be convex. But here, um, it's concave down at this point, meaning it's increasing towards it and decreasing away. So this must be a local max. Okay, So if it's concave down at that point, it's a local maximum. So it's actually somewhat simpler as long as the second derivative is easy to get. Sometimes it's uh, kind of laborious and it's just easier to test the first derivative. So that's why we have two tests. Okay. So we can use this here for this problem because the second derivative is actually relatively easy to get because this is a power function. This is a polynomial rather. So f double prime is what? 6x minus 12. So then we can use the second derivative test second derivative test here and test each of our critical points. So for x equals 1, we take a look and say, all right, what's f double prime at 1? This is 6 times 1 minus 12, which is negative 6, which is less than 0. So we can say for x equals 1, it's concave down, which means that it's a local max. We say, you know, 1, and we don't know the f value here. We can go in and find that real quick. So it would be a height of 19 is a local max. Then we'll test x equals 3. Maybe you want to pause and do this yourself. I'm going to keep cruising. This is 6 times 3 minus 12 which is 18 minus 12, which is a positive 6, which is so greater than 0, which implies the other part here, that it's concave up so that it must be a local minimum. So 3 comma, so we calculate f of 3, and we get that it's equal to 15. So we know that 3 15 is a local minimum. All right, so we've now classified all of our local extrema. So if we go back to our uh, procedure here, we evaluated the function at the critical points and the endpoints of the interval, and then we compare. All right, so we found our local extrema. Now we test endpoints. And so we are looking at, all right, what are our endpoints? Well, we're looking at the entire function here. So I was looking for an interval given. There isn't one. So the global extrema, then we're looking at the tails of f of x at, you know, um, or approaching negative infinity and infinity. So let's take a look at what we'd expect here. So as you know, the limit as x approaches negative infinity for f of x, well, x cubed is going to be the dominant term here. So it's going to kind of trump everything else. And as we input larger and larger negative values, this is actually going to trend towards negative infinity. And likewise, as, the, uh, as we increase without bound, the positive values of x, we're going to get positive infinity. So there really actually is no global extrema based on this fact right here. We'd say no global extrema on negative infinity to infinity because it just keeps increasing without bound to the right and keeps decreasing without bound to the left. It does something like this, right? It's a cubic function. So it doesn't have global extrema on the whole uh, real line. But if we had endpoints, maybe we'll make some up. 
if we had endpoints, like we were defined on the interval, let's say, you know, 0 to 10, at this point, we would find f of 0, we'd find f of 10, and let me just do these quickly for sake of example. So if our interval was 0 to 10, and we found, all right, the value of y is 15 at 0, and it's uh, 505 at x equals 10, meaning, you know, we've got the point 0, 15, and the point 10, 505. This is where you go through, and you look now at all the different points you found. These would be the endpoints of my interval, and these would be my local extrema that I found. And now you're comparing the y values. And so, you know, you do this kind of analysis at the end. You say, what's the highest and lowest value? Well, you'd say now the global extrema on 0, 10. Let's do this because I'm changing the example a bit. The global extrema on 0, 10, we'd have a global minimum at where's the lowest y value? Well, it's kind of a tie between uh, 0 and 3. So we could say at you know, x equals 0, 3, um, and, or sorry, we'd say 0, 15, and 3, 15. It's okay to have a tie here. If, if strictly read, some might say there is no global minimum, but I think this is actually more helpful. And then the global maximum would be at the endpoint 10, 505, right? Nothing touches that in terms of our uh, relative extrema that we found. 19 isn't going to get even close. So these would be our global extrema if we restricted ourselves and then we're able to test these endpoints. But as written, this was asking about the whole interval, the whole real line. And so that we would actually say there is no global extrema um, in that initial example. So that was this other piece. So I'm going to forego this uh, second example and I'll have some more worked problems in the module, but I hope this gives you a, a good overview of the procedure of what we do, why we do it. Um, and again, grabbing those critical points as being candidates, using either derivative test to test them, and then if you're looking for global extrema, comparing those values to make sure Yes, this is the highest, or in fact, there is something that that beats it at one of the endpoints. All right, so this is going to be, this is a bit of a process, but again, you want to have this become more automatic so that when we're using it to solve an applied problem, which we will be doing, that you won't really have to think about it that hard. All right, so I look forward to your questions, and we'll see you in the discussion.